TSN's Motoring 94 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. This week we brought the program to a General Motors assembly plant in St. Therese, Quebec. Now this is one of 32 GM assembly plants in North America, so we had plenty to pick from. Why did we select this one? Well, as you're about to see, this plant is very special in the GM family. It was just a few years ago that it faced a total shutdown as the plant approached its 30th anniversary. Then along came two cars, which made a winner out of General Motors and offered a future to the over 3,000 men and women who work here. The new generation Camaro and Firebird not only saved the plant, but also became one of the biggest success stories in General Motors history. The plant, covering 250 acres, is producing cars for worldwide distribution, and every vehicle is pre-sold. Well, we had some indication of success prior to uh, building that new automobile because we had done several marketing clinics and we knew that we had an indication for success. But we didn't anticipate the level of success right at the start with this car. It's, it's just marvelous because the demand is, is high. When we started 1994 model year, we had 65,000 orders in the bank. And actually for the employees, it's a lot more fun to work on a sport coupe type of car and that they're the sole producer than on the family car. Because uh, every car in this industry, no matter where they're produced and sold in the world, they know they're part of it. The vehicle has just been an absolute phenomenal success in the marketplace. We, um, we have all the orders that we, we know what to do with can't build all the orders we got, as a matter of fact. And so I actually have the luxury of having people sending me inquiries, can you build my order? And, and that's a good feeling that the vehicle is so well received. 27 years ago, when I started here, we were making the uh, 1967 Chevrolet Impala and Parisienne. I've been here 27 and a half years. I've seen all kinds of changes in this plant but uh, none like the change for the Camaro and Firebird. It's really exceptional. The whole plant is completely redesigned and it's bringing a lot of more prosperity to the area. We run two shifts, roughly 50 an hour, and that means we'll build about 180,000 units this year. And the cars are built on the same line, but there's uh, an enormous amount of product differentiation. Uh, I would say that we pretty well build the product complete here. Most of the, uh, the body shop work is done in-house. Uh, go out throughout the body shop, you'll see over 100 uh, electric robots in use. And uh, our robots are primarily uh, put in places for dimensional control. The dimensional integrity of this car is, is uh, superb. Uh, compared to the old car, I mean, it's, it's like night and day. And the, uh, the foundation of the vehicle when you're building a sports car to deliver all the, uh, all the specifications that the customer wants requires that kind of foundation. So our body dimensional control is it's state of the art. This is a team concept plant. We build in groups of uh, around eight to 10 people. And in each team, we have uh, internal process control. They take care of their own, so to speak. And so we really build uh, the vehicle as it goes through the shop. And we verify that build from station to station. So when it comes off the end of the line, uh, we don't really go through an extensive, exhaustive search to see what we've done. The vehicle is right at that point. You can look at the, at the vehicles going down the line here, but if you, uh, if you look at the popularity, it really comes down to black, white, and red, yeah, rather than the more exotic uh, metallic colors. People still like the traditional red, white, and black on a sports car. 
Well, I have 27 years in the uh, auto business this summer. All of it really has been in an assembly plant. It's the fifth assembly plant that I've worked at. And uh, to have a, have a vehicle like this uh, for a plant, you know, th this plant well, at one time uh, had some dark days. You know, the old car they were building, the old A car was going out of business, needed new life. Uh, this plant was able to step up to the challenge, build a, a sports car, which is tough to build. And when you look at it now, look around. Uh, it's a vibrant organization, and uh, people get turned on by just building this kind of a vehicle. Nice coming to work. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice reading all the good uh, literature that comes in from the customers and people wanting products. It's exciting. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we look at the 1995 Mazda Millennia. Now, this vehicle was supposed to be the entry level Amati. Fortunately, when Mazda decided to dump the Amati nameplate, they kept the Millennia in the lineup. Without question, the highlight of the new Millennia is the engine adopted for use in the S model. It's called a Miller Cycle engine. The Miller Cycle was originally designed for stationary engines that ran on diesel. Mazda have adapted this technology for use with gasoline. This engine differs from a conventional engine in two important ways. By delaying the closing of the intake valve, you effectively reduce the compression ratio without affecting the amount of power produced. Combine this with a lithium compressor, aka a supercharger, and you end up with the same amount of power as an engine one and a half times the size without sacrificing fuel economy. During the test, we averaged a commendable 9.9 .9 liters per 100 kilometers, or 28.5 miles per gallon. Well, that's the theory. Does it work in practice? The answer is very effectively so. And it goes down to the intercoolers they've hooked up to the supercharger. And these things are fed cool air through some very effective ducts. The upshot of the whole thing, 210 horsepower and 210 pounds-feet of torque. During the acceleration test, the Millennia ran to the 100k mark in about 8 seconds. The only transmission available is a 4-speed automatic that incorporates Mazda's overly complicated hold system. Why they can't go to a straightforward on-off button for the overdrive totally baffles me. The suspension on the Millennia is comprised of a multi-link design both front and rear. This gives the car a very comfortable compliant ride. The beauty of the multi-link setup in the rear is that it imparts a small amount of tow-in during cornering. This gives the car a very stable, reassuring feel. Given the very sophisticated suspension on this Millennia, I was expecting it to whiz through the pylon test. Unfortunately, it didn't because it has a limiting factor. And the factor is not body roll, it's not understeer, it's the fact that the steering wheel locks mid-transition. In reality, you shouldn't run into that too much, but in the event of a severe evasive maneuver, you could find yourself in trouble. Standard on all Millennias is a four-sensor, three-channel anti-lock brake system. During the brake test, we required just 115 feet to stop from 80K. Tied in with the ABS is a sophisticated traction control system. When the system detects wheel spin, it begins to eliminate it by retarding the ignition timing and cutting off the fuel flow to the injectors. Stopping wheel spin in this manner results in a very drivable unit that does not wear the brakes out prematurely. When I road tested the 929, one of my pet peeves was the size of the trunk and the fact there was no fold down rear seat. On the Millennia, they've addressed the size of the trunk. It's now very usable. However, there is still no fold down rear seat or even a ski pass through. On today's cars, that's unacceptable. Inside, the Millennia is loaded. There's the usual complement of comfort and convenience items, including power windows, locks, mirrors, steering wheel mounted cruise control buttons, as well as the obligatory dual airbags. The audio and climate controls are among the best in the industry. Both feature large controls that are exceptionally easy to use. The dash follows the same thing. The dials are large and easy to read. The power eight-way seats provide plenty of comfort and support. Combine these with the power tilt steering and finding the right driving position is very easy. 
The roomy rear environment features three-point seat belts for both outboard passengers as well as a center armrest. Dotted throughout the interior are numerous storage bins as well as aircraft-style map pockets. The other item worthy of note is the remote control. It features a panic button. All in all, the layout has been very well thought through and executed. That's it for this week's test drive. I think it's safe to say that Mazda have done a super job with the Millennia, so much so that I think it sounds the death knell for the 929. Now, while Mazda insists the demographics of the buyer for the 929 and Millennia are vastly different, I beg to differ. This car runs rings around the 929, meaning we could see the end of it. It's time to update our long-term Volvo here. Now, over the winter, we've got four snow tires on this vehicle. Now, the combination of this very aggressive tread pattern, front-wheel drive and traction control, nothing old man winter has thrown us has stopped this vehicle. However, it's time to get these things off because they are rather noisy. The rolling resistance is rather high, which is impairing fuel economy. And last but not least, the summer tires will improve the handling characteristics. It's just as well that this has happened at this time of year because we've got about 5,000 kilometers on this vehicle, so it's due for an oil change. And just the other day, the service engine light soon started to flash on. So these three items will be attended to in the next couple of days. The style and panache of the 850 have not faded at all. The items that are earning more and more favor are the versatility and convenience of the wagon configuration. The rear storage space is capable of holding an enormous amount of junk, and from a personal perspective, the integrated child seat is proving to be a godsend. Next week, we'll update the Jetta. You're looking at the 25th anniversary Trans Am being built here at the GM assembly plant in St. Therese, Quebec. Now only 2,000 of these vehicles will be built, only 200 going to lots in Canada. And they tell me that already a bidding war is underway. All right, let's now head to the Motoring 94 garage and join Bill Gardner. You know, Brad, when you look at the way those new Firebirds and Camaros are put together, all the high strength steel, the galvanizing, the extensive use of uh, polymer or plastic exterior body panels, there's a car that could conceivably be looking just like new, almost in showroom condition after many, many years of service. And you could conceivably put a lot of miles on those cars as well. So you're going to want to maintain the powertrain in a vehicle like that in such a fashion that it'll be in like new condition when your chassis is still looking like new after 10 or 12 years. And that's the perfect application for today's synthetic lubricants. They're high performance lubricants that are well suited to the uh, demands of many of today's cars like the Firebird, the Camaro, Corvette and other high performance cars. They're going to give you superior performance and protection at extremes of temperature both at the low end, uh, typical Canadian Sub-Zero starting in the winter. Synthetics are much more fluid. They have a far lower pour point. That means that they're very fluid at those low temperatures. They're going to make the engine start well. And in high temperatures that we experience in the summertime, those lubricants are not going to flash off and be consumed or drawn up the PCV valve and burned away as many conventional lubricants are. In extreme applications like turbocharged engines, motorhomes, tow vehicles or marine engines that are highly stressed applications, synthetic oils are really the ticket. There's more and more lubricants coming out now with synthetic base stocks. For example, gear lubes for rear axles, greases, and things like this, all made of synthetic base stocks. And they're a little bit more expensive, but offer your vehicle far better protection. If you've got a brand new vehicle and you want to maintain it in tip-top condition, that's the way to go. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 94. It's not often that a customer gets to visit and pick up his brand new car at the plant. But that was the case for Eric Gangle, the new owner of a Camaro Z28. It is a special day. It's not every day that we get to bring a customer to the plant and see really what's, what's happening in the plant, how his car is going to be built, what takes place. And I guess best of all, it's probably a, a great sensation for an, a future owner of a car to say, wow, I really got to see the nuts and bolts, the engines, the axles, the whole thing go together. It's a great thing for him, I think. I am. I'm really happy to be here today. This is every man's dream to come to a lot full of Trans Ams and Camaro Z28s. You can hear it in the background. Why the Z28? 
I've had a Camaro before, and I was so impressed when I drove the car on the changes and how modern the car is that it's irresistible. We don't do this very often. It's kind of a rare exception, but uh, he's a great, great customer, and Eric Gangle has uh, taken possession of a new Camaro Z28. I think it's uh, probably a very happy day for him, and we sure hope he has a lot of years of happy use out of a great new car. Would you like viewers now to phone uh, Dave McCall personally and then get a personal tour? Well, I'd like to be able to do it for everybody, Brad, but we can't. We just, uh, we don't have the people, we're not set up to do it. And uh, most importantly is it distracts a lot of people at the plant and our production goes all to heck. So no, we can't afford to do it. One of Canada's leading historians was spotted at this year's Toronto Auto Show. Mike Filey, a past member of the Toronto Historical Board and the Ontario Heritage Foundation, has always had a love for history and also the automobile. In fact, he's co-authored a new book about Toronto and the automobile. Well, the inspiration for this book was really what you see around you the automobiles, specifically the automobiles in Toronto. When we did this book, I did it with Victor Russell, the archivist at City Hall, and the, the whole idea of the book was to show a different Toronto, and in fact to show a changing Toronto, Toronto going from no cars to people having to look left and right when they step off the curb, which was new. You know, that, <laughs> that created a lot of problems for people when they weren't used to automobiles, uh, to just step off the curb and boom, be hit by something. They didn't know what it was as it went over them. And so we... Um, we got together a group of photographs that depicted the changing face of Toronto. Um, and we called the book Horse Power, because that's what it was, to Horsepower, because that's what it became. And uh, there were car shows before 1906, but very cleverly, the auto dealers had their own car shows. But the secret was to have them in their showroom. So you really didn't see cars, you saw their cars. You saw Wintons, you saw Pierce Arrows. And it wasn't until 1906 when a group of dealers got together and decided that they would show all the cars that were available to Torontonians. And the year was 1906. We used several photographs in the book to depict what was, what is, or what was coming. And nine out of 10 vehicles were still pulled by horses in fact, Simpsons at one time, traditionally, Simpsons had the dapple grays. You could always tell who was delivering on your street by the color of the horse pulling the, pulling the wagon. You have dapple grays and chestnuts uh, for the Eaton's people. But in, in the photograph are a couple of trucks. And that really says what's happening. The horses are about to vacate the scene and all the deliveries are about to be made by, by automobile of some sort or other. Uh, the other picture we used is the cover photograph which, <laughs> which shows the car and the streetcar and a cow. Now this is called horsepower to horsepower and it's a cow because this was the utter book that I did. The utter book that I did so we put the cow on the cover. <laughs> One of the interesting features of a Toronto street or any city street, Vancouver, doesn't really matter. Take a look at the street and you'll see that the corners are rounded. And we, we don't pay attention to that. I mean the corner is rounded. In the early days they weren't rounded. They, they came to a point. Well that was alright for horses. But when cars started to turn the corner, you know, they, they'd hit that pointed part of the intersection and so they rounded the corners and you can see that today that is a direct result of the automobile making it easier for him to get around the him or her to get around the corner in the car uh, Bitulithic pavements as they were called back in those days uh, the first one was a portion of King Street and a portion of Toronto Street were the first of the streets to have a, a hard pavement but what you used to do in the old days in your automobile was to look for a street that had wood they would take logs and they would slice them like a bologna and they would lay those wood blocks on the streets. Uh, that way, if it rained or a lot of mud or whatever, it would be halfway smooth. And there are some pictures in the book here where you can see the car actually disappearing in the mud on some of the suburban streets. We now take you to Ijiwazu Falls in Argentina for the beginning of the annual Camel Trophy adventure. For the next 20 days, teams from 18 countries will have the adventure of their lives in South America. Participants in the event will drive through swamps and jungles and the world's driest desert as they cross Paraguay en route to the finish on the Pacific Ocean just south of Santiago, Chile. Americans Mac Barber and Dave Simpson were among more than one million applicants worldwide who vied for the right to represent their countries. Intensive training and expert instruction have prepared them for the challenge to defend the Camel Trophy, won for the first time last year by a U.S. team. 
The final selections for camel trophy teams took place in Istanbul, Turkey at the International Trials. During several rigorous days of intense testing, judges look for the right combination of strength, skills, spirit and compatibility for each national team. For the first time in history, two women from France and Sweden had the right combination to impress the judges and their fellow competitors with their tenacity and capabilities, and won coveted berths on their national teams. Stay tuned for more. Our Midas tip of the week concerns one of the downfalls of operating a vehicle consistently on dirt roads. Now this vehicle spends most of its life on unpaved roads. You can see by the mud on the side that it gets a lot of abuse. And that billowing cloud of mud and water that comes off the front wheels of the car tends to fatigue the underside of the car, the suspension components, and in particular, the brake system. Now, if the car has disc brakes on the rear as this one does, those components are really subject to a lot of abuse. Things like seized calipers, heavily scored and rusted rotors, and brake pads that become stuck or seized in their keyways are all facts of life for a car like this. Now, if you remember the older cars with drum brakes, the brake drum actually slid over the entire brake mechanism and completely enshrouded it, and the centrifugal force of the drum turning would sling all, those, all of that debris away from the brake mechanism. Those cars were pretty good in this, this type of condition, but today's cars, many of them with four-wheel disc brakes, are getting an awful lot of fatigue from that. Now, if your car is operated in the city, you may never encounter these conditions and never have these kind of problems. But if it's operated on secondary roads, be prepared for more frequent servicing and costlier brake jobs, particularly on those rear brakes. That's your Midas tip of the week. The only way I'll ever be able to afford one of these babies is by putting in a little overtime. I'll be right back in Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. A couple of years ago on Kenzie's Corner, I commented that some Canadian car workers seem to be getting awfully whiny. Give me this, guarantee me that. Well, I said at the time that if you didn't want your job, there was no shortage of people in Taiwan or the Philippines that would be more than happy to have it. The only way to guarantee employment in this day and age is to build good quality at low cost. Now, I'm not going to take any credit for it, but the people at this factory, the General Motors Camaro Firebird Assembly Plant in Boisbriand, Quebec, have really done that. A couple of years ago, this plant was slated to be closed, but with good management, leadership, and good support from the union, this factory turned it around, and they're now the only source for Camaros and Firebirds. Anywhere in the world you see one of these cars, you know it was built right here in Canada. And you know, when people ask me about these cars, they always say, Camaro, Firebird, or Mustang? Well, my views on that subject are pretty well known too. On last year's Car of the Year show, I said that the Camaro and Firebird were great looking cars, 275 horsepower, four wheel disc anti-lock brakes, dual airbags, six speed manual gearbox, standard equipment for less than $24,000. Nobody, particularly the Ford Mustang, can come close to that. I'm Jim Ken. When you look at all these brand new Camaros and Firebirds, it's hard to believe that you can wait, in some cases, up to six months for delivery. And while most of these cars are headed to the United States, GM tells me they're going to add on an extra $1,800 for Canada. Sounds good to me. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 94 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State. One Tough Motor Oil, and Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas.